Now you're welcome back. There was club action up and down the country across the weekend, as you know, I'm sure. And we wanted to touch on one of the more interesting games which had a lot going on. It was Ballyhale Shamrocks against James Stevens in the Kilkenny Senior Hurling County Final. Ballyhale won the game 121 to 211. So a seven point win in the end for Ballyhale. Uh, that makes it five in a row. They have uh, an extraordinary record now. They've won half of the Kilkenny County Championships available to them this century which is a crazy thought, really. Only founded 50 years ago, and now already they join Tullerone, top of the Roll of Honour list with 20 senior championships. So an extraordinary um, achievement, an extraordinary club. And TJ Reid, who's 35 next month, very much at the heart of it. He uh, scored six points, uh, two from play. He created another four. There was an outrageous overhead uh, catch as well which I think has been doing the rounds on social media. And uh, Ballyhale have had their fair share of tragedy off the field as well over the last 12 months or so. And it was something uh, TJ Reid spoke about on TG Cahar afterwards. Have a listen. Well, TJ, five in a row or 20 titles, which is better? <laughs> Any of them. Um, I, I suppose just today, it was one county final we needed to win. Obviously, five in a row um, was after that, but today was about winning about going out and performing and going out and expressing ourselves and um, and, and just um, fantastic to display. And what you did today, when, when, when it was put up to you, you, you responded so well. They got a goal, you came back, what I think, seven points from the trot. At halftime, you were 3-4 you were ahead. What was the feeling at halftime? Good win the second half. <laughs> Fairly straightforward. Um, but look, um, this team, what can I say, um, been through um, high and lows, over the last couple of years, um, you know, at half time we spoke about what happened in Crow Park. We were three or four points up, and Belly Gunner stayed with us, and we saw what happened. So, so today was about getting to the next level. Harry Mullen got sent off. That was the time to, to respond, and we did. We, we took over in the last probably 20 minutes, we took over that field. Those chaps out there are just unbelievable. Um, you know, like emotional stuff, really, you know. Um, unreal. Yes, not like him to get emotional, actually. You hear him there uh, tearing up at the end. And he was speaking afterwards about, well, I guess, such an intrinsically uh, club scenario where he was saying of all the um, deaths in the community over the last uh, year or so. We carried those names with us all year. The one word we used this year was dedicate. And so we aim to dedicate this county final to those families because we're after carrying that coffin through Ballyhale too many times. Today was about us being together as a group and seeing the families around us here gives us that bit of a lift. So uh, emotional day, I think, for all concerned. Eddie Brennan is with us on the line. Good evening, great to have you on. Good evening, Joe, how are you? Yeah, very good. So Ballyhale, full value for their five in a row? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, you have to just, um, I suppose, like anything, Sport generally, the you know you love seeing teams uh, you know winning something, and they're coming from maybe a small base, and like Valley Hills did in, in 1972. You know, the, I think there's a, a collection of clubs came together. You know, you know he has not four for I think maybe not Milan. I'm not sure, but in 72 they formed up. So you'd say they've got through a lot. And from the outside looking in, you know I remember being brought to their matches by my dad uh, through the 80s, and it was always. It was almost like a hurling education going in there. Like you'd say to you, watch this and watch that and just watch how smart they play. Uh, and that has just become culture in their club. I think you can't but admire them. I think sometimes, you know, champions are there and, and everyone wants to see a new champion. But I think you just cannot but, but admire what they've done. Um, you know, I, I just found myself even yesterday, I, I was unfortunate enough not to be able to, to make it. And I watched it on telly and I found myself pausing certain aspects of the game just to see you know, little things going around around the edge of the ball and how many players Valley Hale lads were able to beat and how smart they were on the ball and just the beauty in the simplicity, like of just flicking a ball out when, when lads are coming in to hit them. Uh, they're able to take physical punishments. Uh, they don't, you know, generally get involved in any silly stuff either. Like, I mean, I think just one thing I'll throw out there, like, I mean, I can't recall TJ Reid get booked uh, throughout most of his career, you know, let alone get the line. I don't think he has ever got the line. So, um, it shows that they can hurl whatever way you want and they don't get involved in, in needless stuff either. So nothing nothing but admiration, Joe, for them. You have to take your hat off and say to a small rural club what they've done. And again, I was just going through numbers here earlier on. Like what what's in that 50 years, right? In 1974, I think they won the intermediate. So they went up senior in 1974. 
by 1978, they won their first senior and then they rattled off, I think, a three in a row. But somewhere around 92, 93, they got relegated. So from 1991, when they last won it, we'll say, uh, they didn't win it again until 2006. They were in the county final in 2005. So that's a 13, 14 year barren period in the middle of that 50 year history. So um, it just goes to show, I suppose, how good they are. They've only lost six county finals. So the numbers for a small world club with a small playing base. And I think we all seen the, the picture that went up yesterday of the adult players in the club. It's a very small pool they're picking from. But they have a culture that's just embedded in their players. And again, from a neighbouring club who'd love not more than to beat them and all that, mm. you have to admire them. Guys, really interesting. Um, I, I heard Paul Murphy talking with Jaron Friday looking ahead to the game. And he was even making the point that you could imagine that when you turn up at the Ballyhale pitch like it's going to be some centre of excellence it's a very normal functional but yeah. very normal place it is it is a very very humble place um, they have big plans I think there, there's a big uh, development pro, uh, project in place but um, when you go in there you know I, I think I, I suppose sometimes you, 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 there's quagmires in club you know you say well let's get good facilities there well I think with Ballyhale it's like no no let's let's make sure the important stuff is the important stuff and yes they have good modern facilities they, they you know they're, and they're obviously going to develop those but the important things are always I suppose on the pitch and they're they're doing the business on the pitch uh, and like again you go you go down there look very very ordinary guys um, and look I suppose even training them like I have a vision, a bit tongue in cheek, that you know when we feel, you know, we felt Henry leaving them a few years ago. You're, you sometimes feel, and I think the boys even touched on just that there's only one way they could go. James O'Connor comes in, goes and wins another club, all Ireland, another two county finals, and now you know you Pat Hoban is in, and you say, God, does he just go down and train and sit down in the dugout and let the boys off? You know, because <laughs> they they just have this innate ability and this understanding of each other. And, uh, you know, again, like as, as Paul said, they're just a very, very down to earth uh, rural community that's, that just loves their bit of hurling and, yeah. and look like any communities, they've, they've had their ups and downs too. So it's fascinating to hear even you and your dad going along to games in the 80s and him saying, watch out for almost the intelligence or the, the, the quickness of mind. And here we are 40 years later, and that's still almost kind of woven into the fabric of what they're doing today. Is there an overarching, like it's funny with, with the passing recently of Brian Mullins, there was there was so much talk of, well, Heffernan and Mullins almost being like these figureheads for Vincent's. There's no overarching famous figure as such with Ballyhale, is there? It's it's just a collective. It's probably a collective. Like when you look at maybe the team that made the breakthrough on, on the formation of the club was, was backbone by seven Fenley brothers, uh, you know, Michael and Colin's dad and... Uh, Michael Senior and his six brothers and you know they were almost on every line on the pitch uh, and then there was you know Holden's thrown in Welsh is thrown in you know Hulan, Frank Hulan, I think played with Kilkenny as well um, Johnny Welsh you know there was Masons there was you know just like any rural community you have your kind of constant family generational families that bring guys through and every one of those lads that's on the pitch there yesterday like in the Reeds as well which is you know their uncle Hurl with Kilkenny so there's there's just uh you know I suppose generations it's, it's almost handed down and and I'd love to <laughs> I'd love to go down and find what the secret recipe is because um like I said there you're just curious to know how how they do you know the smart stuff and the clever stuff and I'm not look geez I'm obviously you know in awe of them because you have to admire them and you know but you'd be managing, you know, coaching your own young lads in the club and you're kind of going, you know, to, to get those little smart stuff in into them. And you say, it's just something, it's, it's a trait that's really, really interesting that, you know, even watch some of the stuff yesterday, you know, TJ going in there and there's three and four lads bouncing off him and he's still able to just nudge the ball out, kick it on another two foot with his toe and next thing it's in his hand and he's not forcing the shot because two lads are covering one side of him. He spins back around and looks over and here's, you know, his brother loose 40 yards, this 40 yard pass, and it's a point. So uh, it's just everything they do is just this, this hurling intelligence. And, you know, as, as I said yesterday in, in an old tweet, you, you can't go into a shop and buy that. You know, that's something that's obviously just, just handed down and, you know, game smarts and, and just clever brains when it comes to hurling, like doing the right thing and seeing what's coming. You know, they see the hit coming, they're able to take it. And look, like I said, even there yesterday, look, they, you know, I seen Tiji even 
you know, well able to give lads a shoulder. And again, all legitimate and fair and, and within the rules, nothing silly. So many ingredients to this final. So you had Brian Cody on the James Stevens <laughs> sideline. Uh, Seamus Dwyer, it seems, called Cody up and asked him to come in as a selector once he'd stepped down from the county job. And they haven't won a county championship since '05 and, and weren't necessarily favoured this year. But I'm sure having Cody involved doesn't hurt. And then on the other side of things, uh, by all accounts, Henry Shefflin gave an extraordinary speech to the team on the Friday evening. Shefflin, of course, being their manager in 2019 and 2020 where they won All-Ireland titles. So Colin Fenley was talking about this and he said it was Friday evening. Uh, it was a big surprise for us. They weren't expecting it, but I think uh, Henry Shefflin's good friends with the, the manager. Big surprise for us, but just the emotion in Henry's voice. There was pure silence in the room. Everyone walked out of there ready. The hunger was there. He didn't say anything about Paul. That's his uh, late brother now. He didn't say anything about Paul, but you could see it. You could just see the emotion in him and the hunger and he'd love to be out there. So... I mean, there are geez, powerful kind of forces going on behind Ballyhale as well. Yeah, in fairness, um, I think I think that's what I think. Sometimes when we talk about motive, motivation, and like you, like I said, there, you know, we've all maybe been doubting or wondering when will Ballyhale lose that motivation, and you know, the good teams do that. They find a way to motivate themselves, and they find a way to to just uh, reinstill, you know, that belief and that tradition that's there, like and. Uh, I suppose look, you've you've a lovely blend as well. Like you've experienced guys there, and like any parish, I think regardless to where lads go and what they do, they still you gravitate back towards your own. You gravitate back towards your parish, and when they're involved in in the club scene, especially in the the shake up and the championship, it just brings everybody there together. Like and look, Henry is doing what he's doing above in Galway, but you know he's 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 first and foremost a Bally Hale man, and 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 obviously you know he's he's. You know, maybe someone that you know was in there with the guys, and and I think sometimes you want to move on as well. But he's obviously a Bally Hale man, true and true, and you know he showed that. And and by doing that, I, I only heard that today. I wasn't aware of that at all. So um, it, it's an interesting thing, and it's just something that maybe can be that little trigger, that just that last little bit that gets lads really, really focused. And um, I'm supp- I suppose uh, <laughs> looking at the year that was in it, there was probably. Um, maybe would he have gone in if it wasn't the village involved? <laughs> <laughs> Are you saying Brian Cody may have been mentioned on Friday evening or no? <laughs> ah, no, I, I don't know. I think, I think the, I think the lads would be bigger than that too. I think. Do you? I think. Yeah, look, I think. No, I think of course, emotion, I miss it. I miss emo- it. Ah, yeah, no, no, obviously, no. Emotion is a, is is something that you have to be very careful how you use it, and I think the one thing is sometimes emotions can get the better of you, and you know, I recall Jackie Turtle saying that the last time that they won, that he let his emotions get the better of him and it led to losing control. So I suppose there's a huge balance when you're, you know, talking to a group and trying to find that balance of, you know, uh, clicking the emotion side of it and what it means to people, but without kind of, you know, overshooting the runway either, because I think sometimes that can happen. And, you know, I think, you know, maybe someone like Henry is obviously quite experienced in that and, and can read the room and, and like I said you have a balance of young lads and old lads in that dressing room so um, it seems to have worked um, but particularly I thought you could sense before half time you know I thought they they responded fierce well to the goal that James Stevens got they got two points straight away and I just kind of commented to the young lad at home and said look they've just, the goal squashed out straight away and I said it'll be interesting now if if and Bally Hale came close to getting the goal before half time but they were able to tag on a few points and I thought that was the foundations but then when Paddy Mullen, you know, needlessly got that red, Valley Hill just seemed to go into another gear. Yeah. There's something very striking about that, isn't there? Your dad bringing you along to look at Bally Hale in the 80s and then here we are in 2022 and you're saying to your young lad, watch these lads now and watch how they respond. There's uh, there's a, there, there's something in that. Um, on uh, Cody, by the way, at Stevens, like it's such a uh, interesting uh, case study in the, this kind of utterly dominant, maybe the greatest of all time, going in as a selector in a club team. I didn't see the game yesterday. I was kind of in, I was in here uh, presenting and we were busy doing various things I don't know how much the camera cut to the Stephen sideline I, I, I can't imagine him being anything but dominant on that sideline it's it's hard to imagine him kind of just peering in like a, just another selector yeah I, I, I it, 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 it wouldn't be the brain Cody that we all know and love anyway um, I think he, he, he just looked that's his persona but to be fair it looked as if he was very much kind of back a little bit from it all I mean there was a little incident on the sideline you know, he wasn't anywhere near it. In fairness, he stood back and, and you know, the camera trained for him once or twice, but it was generally focused on, uh, you know, Seamus Dwyer and, and probably Peter to a lesser extent. 
that they were they were shame seemed to be the one doing it and look um I don't know what kind of role Brian would have played there but look obviously you know maybe uh uh maybe a mentor just so, someone standing back watching things and you know keeping the standards I think was always Brian's big thing so maybe mm. just in terms of the standards and training but um I tell you it was a bit you know it's a big it's a brave move maybe by someone like Seamus Dwyer to bring someone like Brian in there because God he's a huge presence to have uh and particularly if you're the you know the, the number one you're the manager um you know you certainly want to you know to to maintain kind of you know what you want in your dressing room mm. um but again it's a, it's a, I think it's it, it was brave but um look ultimately uh James Stevens just probably hadn't the quality they came close two years ago in a semi-final um but they they just hadn't the quality I think if you're sitting down to plan for Bally Hale I was looking at it there the weekend and said where do you start you know <laughs> what do you do with your your you know your better players like and um for me look one of the things is very easy to say now but you know I think James Stevens you know lost out by having Key and Kenny back at center back you know he's a guy who can score and I just think they they maybe lack that threat but I suppose you're trying to get the balance of your team right uh, one thing I always like about you is that you know how to use Twitter. Uh, Twitter <laughs> is about saying things in the heat of the moment that may come back and bite you in the ass. And you are a master at that, I always think. It's, it's to your credit. <laughs> You're never dull on Twitter. So uh, here we go. TJ is the GOAT. Time up on this argument. The greatest hurler with the greatest brain. I thought, bloody hell, Eddie Brennan. Going for it. So yeah. TJ is the GOAT. How long have you thought TJ is the GOAT? Um, I think it's an argument that has probably been brewing nicely for the last two or three seasons. I think, um, I think, you know, it's the longevity of him now. And look, look, he, he has he has some amount of peers to measure up against, doesn't he? Um, you know, in his own club, let alone you know some of the lads I got to hurl with. But I think I think what maybe you know is is now really putting that argument very very up there and and in my view it, it it should be i think he's it's probably the fact that you know with kilkenny over the last couple of seasons he has really upped the ante he is you know he is the main the spine of that team in terms of a lot goes through him or so much goes through him and you know if, if he's held i think opposition are looking at him for the last couple of seasons for kilkenny and they realize that if they can hold him they might go a good bit towards beating Kilkenny. And look, don't get me wrong, there's plenty of quality there. You know, I think, you know, has had Richie Hogan maybe not been as injured as he was over the last couple of seasons, last four or five years, you know, could Kilkenny, you know, was, when you look at the file, the two of them provided for each other in 2014 and 15. So um, in that regard, I think the fact that Kilkenny have had, you know, a relatively barren, a barren they've had no All-Ireland success since 2015, and I still think, you know, year after year, TJ is delivering. Um, and and I think that's what now is going to propel him into that because years ago it was said about DJ that DJ was kind of, you know, the, the, the main player in the attack. And if he played well, he brought the other lads into the match. And if he was held, Kilkenny were beaten. Mm. So, and I don't mean that in, in any disrespect to any other players. I just think TJ Reid has excelled in his game. He has brought it to another level. And I just look at, like I mentioned earlier, He's the lad that teams will target, club and county, you know, through league and nothing matches. Maybe sometimes in, in matches, lads go at him hard, two or three lads go at him, and yet he does not get distracted. He does not get involved in silly stuff, and his, his discipline record is impeccable. Um, and again, he's well able to look after himself. And, and yesterday, I just I think it was always a strength of his, but his ability, his aerial ability is phenomenal. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, for young lads, if they want to look at even the first half, he got a point, how he kind of leaned in on his his marker you know with his hurl and then popped up the hand and caught it like it's it's just it's just he's a joy to watch in fairness to him and yes I do I do think Joe he's very much up there now yeah. as one of the greatest in Kenny Hurdles of all time Well if you're a student of the game and, and so I, I you know I wouldn't, I wouldn't take any of that lightly and, and how can we talk about the Rackards or Laurie Marr or Christy Ring or Jimmy Doyle or and then into Kilkenny Eddie Kerr and then there's Brian Whelan Jack Lynch DJ Carey and I don't know, this century, whoever you want to pick out, Joe Canning, I would presumably think increasingly, Keen Lynch, JJ, Tommy, I don't know. And then, of course, Henry. Like, I think the consensus over the last couple of years would be, if you said to most people, well, who do you think is the greatest of all time? They would say, well, with respect to those players, I couldn't see live properly going back the decades. I think Henry sort of has that general consensus mantle at the moment. Yeah, perhaps he has. And this is sometimes, I know, look, I'm, I'm maybe 
contradicting myself a fraction here now by saying this, but I think that's the beauty, I suppose, is we'll, we'll argue and we'll, we'll talk about these things and we'll debate who is the greatest, but ultimately, you know, our team can't be compared to, you know, maybe the Cork team of the 70s that won three in a row or the, the Wexford team of the 50s and 60s and the tip teams of, you know, yesteryear and Kilkenny teams of the past because, you know, obviously there's such an evolution and such a, a change in, in preparation and hurling and all those things and there's different styles of game now. But I suppose that is the beauty of it is that we have, you know, people in our communities that remember all those guys playing and they talk about them with such fondness. And then we be turned around, all the young lads now around Kilkenny, like they, they just idolise TJ Reid at the moment, you know, because, and, and, and other guys obviously as well, because they're the guys they look up to. But, um, you know, and, and I suppose that's, that's what's ahead of us in, in the winters. That's what keeps us mm. going for the next season is that we can talk about these things and hear lads talking about the, the greats of the game. But um, I suppose all we can talk about is is right here, right now. Yeah. And look, I was fortunate enough to play with both of them, Henry and TJ. Yeah, and, and so you think of this era, if we take it as, say, the 21st century, for you it's TJ just about. Oh, it is, yeah. I, I, I just... And again, look, I know sometimes... Uh, how good a player maybe isn't reflected in the honours he's won, but by God, t- you know, T.J. Reid has a, you know, I, I think if he put a horse box on the car, he probably wouldn't fill all the awards and all the medals he has won over his career. And I think he's been very unlucky probably not to have a second or third even hurler of the year. Mm. And you said in that tweet, the greatest hurling brain. Yeah, I, I, I think this is this is something that I, I, I really latch on to and, and that I really look for in, in, in guys is that, he can see things happening around him. He can see lads, you know, a peripheral vision. And I remember, you know, someone talked before about a documentary on Wayne Rooney that he was, you know, looking at links or jerseys close by or that type of thing. But I just think, like, TJ sees that the ball is there on the ground and there's a lad coming in to flick it. And he uses his hurl to deflect that flick and just prod out the ball with his toe. Like, everything he does has method to it. And, you know, I've, I texted even Ray Boyne there yesterday evening about a clip, a score that Ballyhale got that we, he put up there later on and TJ was invo- involved twice and I watched it about 10 or 12 times to watch where he came from not involved in the play to get involved sends a great you know then he gets back involved the second time and he has an option maybe to shoot himself you know five or six James Stephen lads bearing down them you know he almost slows down when everyone is speeding up and then carries for another two steps and then suddenly he finds space and next thing he has a man heads up and just pops it off. So his brain is going the whole time. You know, you talk about the snooker players that they're three or four shots ahead. I mm. think TJ Reid definitely is that way. He operates that way. And actually, I, I don't know the answer to this at all, but I'd be very interested. Is that an instinctive intelligence on his part? Like, it, or, could he in the dressing room ahead of a game or on a Tuesday planning out a game, could he talk at length about tactics and the best way of doing things? Or is he more somebody who just reacts on a pitch without almost knowing what, why or how he's doing it? I think it's 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 probably I, I don't think you can talk about stuff like that. I don't think, you know, TJ could, you know, empty the brain to everybody about what he's planning on doing. I don't think that's that's possible. I think it's just he's playing things as they happen. Um and and I think, you know, it's something that, you know, Ballyhale might have had a tactic there, you know, where they were the last couple of seasons I've seen him, they're they're rotating positions in the forwards. So, you know, TJ happens to go in and get a ball around the square, puts the ball over the bar. Next thing he holds that full forward. And even just before half time, you know, I was sensing, I said, if he goes in full forward after this point, Jesus, there could be a goal coming. And, you know, dear McCody is full back. He's after being booked. So TJ is just, he's playing what's happening around him. He's able to sense what's going on. He'll go back out. And I saw him, you know, deep in the first half, up in his own line, putting in the tackle as well. So I think he he goes with what's happening. I think he senses what's around him. And generally, well, he lads too, in fairness, you know, they know not to go into a ruck maybe that there's one or two lads in there. I, I, I see with him, particularly from midfield up, they don't commit to rocks. They let one or two lads in. Next thing the ball just flies out of the rock. There's always one or two lads moving. So, yeah. um, you know, I, again, just the, the words that are, are abandoning me now to describe them. But like I said, overreaching thing here for me is just admiration. And, and again, look, when you have someone like TJ Reid, doesn't that make young lads in the club want to, to play with him and want to win something with him? Yeah, well, look, the best of his era, the best of his generation are pretty big words. So I, I presume Henry is, is, is on the tip of your tongue here. Who are the handful that push him closest in your mind of, of say, the last 25 years? Um, oh, Jesus. Uh, probably, look, I think, you know, obviously I'm going to be a, a tad biased to our own crew. Like, you know, JJ is up there for me as, as probably the greatest, uh, you know, 
again, a good hurling brain as well, Tommy, the competitor. But I think, you know, Keen Lynch, another couple of seasons now, he's he's right in there. Um, you know, I suppose influential. Owen Kelly, I think, from Tipperary is another guy that I would class as as being right up there with the best of them. Um, you know, Watford, you know, as someone like, you know, Ken Ken McGrath or someone. And I don't know what, look, it's it's moving on to, to to lads now, you know, obviously the the modern generation of players like this. There's lots of guys coming through. You know, you'd say Patrick Horgan has had a, an unbelievable career with Cork, but um, yeah, look, I suppose on the spot, Joe Canning. You know, there's there's, there's lots of guys in there, mm. um, but I think I think when you look at you know you see generation a generation of players comes through, and I think this is what maybe singles out, and especially in the club championship and that you've seen a generation of board players, Portona, Atten Roy, you know, um, teams, you know, Kula came through there for two years. But Bally Haler, after producing, you know, a third, a three generations of Club All Ireland winners, and I think it's 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 something that, you know, all the other great clubs and all the clubs that have been successful in counties and club championships, um, you know, to, to be able to come back and do it, you know, with a third or fourth generation is 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 really for me what just sets the Bally Haler guys above that at the moment. Yeah, well, look, they sound worth the a documentary. Bally Hale, kind of an extraordinary thing over the last 50 years for sure. Um, I, I suppose, look, you, you can set a debate in motion now, which will yes. get us through October, which is uh, good of you. So um, I'd be interested to see what text message you're, you're getting on the back of uh, <laughs> back of this. Uh, thanks so much for coming on. Appreciate it, Eddie. No bother at all, Joe. Anytime. Cheers. Eddie Have Brennan with us there.